We'll be in the book of Acts for many more months as we are unpacking this idea of the unexpected journey. There's not one of us here, if we're honest, that would say that we're right where we thought we were going to be about a year ago. Five years ago, ten years ago. You get it. We're just along for the ride with Jesus. And it's on this unexpected journey that we need to know more about who he's calling us to be, especially in light of who he is. And so we get to look at the early church to get a better understanding of both of those things. We're learning what it means to carry on the power of the Holy Spirit as the baton was handed from Jesus to his apostles and now to us, his ambassadors, his Christ followers. And, and we're simply continuing on what Jesus began some 2,000 years ago when he walked the earth, sinless and perfect. And so we pick up today at the temple grounds yet one more time. We're still at the temple where the, the, the lame beggar was miraculously healed by God's perfect timing when Peter and John walked up to the temple. They said what? He, he looks at them like, give me some money, give me some alms, give me some pity. And Peter does what? He reaches down his hand and he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have to you I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And guess what? He got up and he walked for the first time into the temple. In over 40 years, he'd never been able to go into there. He comes out dancing a jig, and there's thousands of people watching, trying to figure out what is going on. This guy, we've stepped around him for four decades, and now he's walking with us. What's going on? They asked the question, and Peter answered it. He said, it's not by our own power that we have done this. It is by the power of the name of Jesus Christ that this man was raised up, that he's able to walk caused a big commotion. We learned last week this commotion got the attention of the big dogs. The big dogs come out and they want peace because it's almost nighttime and they're going to shut down the temple grounds. So they arrested Peter and John, throw them in the clinker overnight so they can do trial basically the next day. That's where we pick up this morning, the next day. I've titled this week's sermon, Can't Stop, Won't Stop. See, I'm going I'm to go this blunt to start out. Whatever you believe is the most important thing to you, whatever that is, then that's actually what it is. See, we can't say that something is so important to us, but our life doesn't reflect it. That's called a lie. So if the most important thing to you is your finances, that's going to be self-revelatory in how you live your life. If the most important thing to you is your health, that's going to show in how you live your life. If it's your kids, if it's your work, if it's your identity, if it's your image, we can go on and on all day long, but you understand whatever you say that is, your life is simply a continuation of living out of that. And so if you say that Jesus Christ is the most important thing in my life, then your life had better well reflect it. Otherwise, that again is a lie. See, for the apostles, they were all in for Jesus. They were all in. They gave up everything. They witnessed all the things that he did and said, and they were like, you know what? Where, what, like what Peter said, where else are we going to go? Who else has the answers? So for us today, I want us to answer, what is the most important thing to you? And you don't even need to answer it out loud. I can just watch your life for a week, and I can tell you what the most important thing in your life will be. So we'll start in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 5. We have a big chunk to get through today, but by God's grace, We'll not only get through it, but we're going to learn a few things along the way. Starting in verse 5, our brother Luke records these events this way. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, and by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Let's pray over the text. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you asking that the text that I just read, this text that you supernaturally have preserved for thousands of years, God, we ask that you would, through the power of your Holy Spirit, make this text make sense in our hearts. You would open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to see and to hear what it is that you would have for us today. God, I believe that you've orchestrated everybody that's supposed to be sitting in here or listening online so that we can sit under your teaching. And I pray that you would do just that. You would give us your teaching this morning. We bless you for what you're about to do and we humbly submit our hearts and our lives to you. In Jesus' precious, powerful name, we all pray. Amen. 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 Let's just jump right in. Starting in verse 5, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. See, Peter and John, we just talked about, they were just arrested for doing good stuff. They were just arrested. So now Luke's going to introduce us to a very, very corrupt court system. On first reading, you're like, what do you mean it's corrupt? Well, let, let me explain it to you. There's a backdrop here about all the guys that are in this system and in this council. It's better known as, it's called, it's the Sanhedrin. Have you heard of the Sanhedrin? That's what these guys are. That's the name of this, this group. And we've talked about it a little bit. There were 71 guys, including the high priest, right? But right now we're specifically focusing on this family of leaders. You got Annas, the high priest, You've got Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and, and this back in the day would be what we would call today our Supreme Court. Okay, so this is the top court of the land. That's who Peter and John are standing before. And so we've got the rulers, we've got the elders, we've got the scribes, those are the ones that are making up the Sanhedrin, but then we've got these specific, specific people. The Sadducees were the leaders of this courtroom. And the high priest was the one that was overseeing all of it. He was the big boss, right? That's who he is. See, the Sanhedrin had a job to do. They had to evaluate every new teaching to make sure that it didn't go against their Judaistic beliefs. That was their job. So what they were doing is right. They, they were investigating. They were interrogating, if you will, because this was going against what they had been teaching. And so their job was to make sure that what was being taught at the temple grounds was according to their Jewish law. And so you got the, the rulers, you got the elders and the scribes. We've talked about them. The rulers are the ones who make the laws. They got the leaders who are in charge of all this. The scribes are the ones that are supposed to know all the Bible, right? These are the guys that copied it down and reiterated it. These people know the word of God. They know the Old Testament really, really well. And they're gathered here in Jerusalem. There's a spot west of the temple where they would have been meeting. So they didn't have to go too far. They'd have to bring everybody in. That's where they were, they were meeting. So this is where this trial is taking place. So you got all these big dog leaders. Specifically, I want to talk to you about Annas, Caiaphas, and John and Alexander. See, it says they were all of the high priestly family. These are the same people that went after Jesus. These are the same ones that sentenced him. I get that from John 18. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they had led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Do you see all these names? Annas, high priest. Caiaphas is his father-in-law. He was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews 
that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Caiaphas, with his bright idea, was the one that was partially in charge of getting the crowds rallied up against Christ. So what this looks like outside looking in, clearly the deck is stacked against Peter and John. Okay, but here's the really cool thing. My kids, God doesn't play the odds. He knows what he's doing. So just because the deck is stacked in their life or in our life, that doesn't mean that God hasn't lined it up so he can do what only he can do. Sure, outside looking in, this is a very corrupt political family that's about to make some big decisions, but that doesn't mean that God's still not orchestrating all these events. See, Annas was highly influential, highly influential, and he didn't want to give up his power. He really liked being the high priest. There's some real accolades and, and financial benefits that came from this role. But what you see behind me is a court system made up mostly of a corrupt family that passed on their basic role to the next family member in line. John and Alexander, they were members, Annas, Caiaphas, they're all part of the same family and they liked it that way because guess what? They can control it then much, much better than bringing in outsiders. So Peter and John are standing before a corrupt family. The stage is set and so now we get a look at how it unpacks. And when they had set them in their midst, so they bring them in, they acquired by, by what power or by, by what name did you do this? You can almost picture them, right? They got their robes on, their pomp and circumstance. And they're like, we want an answer here. We want to know by what power, by what name. And when it says inquired, it's a, it's a, it means that they kept asking over and over. This was, the, this, we only get part of the the story, okay? Luke doesn't record verbatim everything that happened. So it, what it means is they kept inquiring. They were interrogating them at this point. And, and I want you to get a visual of what this would have looked like. This is a pretty decent schematic that was, that was produced. Historians, they tell us that it was built intentionally so that all the Sanhedrin would have been sitting in a semicircle like this, all elevated. The prisoners or those being on trial would have stood in the middle of all of them so that this idea of them looking down, it was very intentionally designed to have uh, the power going to all of the religious leaders. Everybody else was seated and there they stand before them. By what power or by what name did you do this? They want answers. See, they want answers, but they don't want to hear the name of Jesus. They tried to extinguish that name by killing him. And yet now they know that this guy's power is being lived out in his people. They can't figure this out. They don't want to hear his name, but they are watching the same miracles that Jesus did now happening through his people. By what power or by what name? See, they addressed it. The way, they, the way that they addressed it is they're convinced that Peter and John had committed a crime. This is a court of trial. This isn't let's sit around and sing Kumbaya and hear really good stories. They're interrogating them for a crime that they committed on their own temple grounds. And they're like, Who, how did you do this? It's an interrogation. They're trying to figure out how a Galilean fisherman could do miracles. It just doesn't make sense in their world. But see, what they don't understand is that God had lined up a divine opportunity. A moment in time where God's supernatural power would be bestowed upon somebody in such a way that their life would be changed forever. God does this today still. God is still doing and, and setting up divine opportunities for his people. And then, then Peter, I love it, filled with the Holy Spirit, he says to them, rulers of the people and elders. If we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, I want to stop right there and then we'll, we'll unpack more. Right away, Peter did not do this on his own. Luke is very clear the way that he wrote it. Peter is nothing more than a vessel. Same thing with our lives. God can move supernaturally and we are nothing but a vessel. Willing vessel, absolutely. But that's all we are. We're a conduit for the king, as was Peter. So it says right here, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. A super profound principle here, my kids. It is the Holy Spirit who enables us to speak boldly. Not us. This is the power of the living God residing in us, giving us what we need to do the work that he has called us to do. And there are times when we are operating in what's called the filling or the power of the Holy Spirit. This does not mean that the Holy Spirit leaves us. 
Okay? The Holy Spirit is the seal that never wears out. When we are baptized into the Holy Spirit, when we're walking with the Lord, the Holy Spirit never leaves us. That's not what this is saying, that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came back upon Peter. This is what's called an anointing. That's the word the church uses. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And there are times when we have an anointing or an infilling of the Holy Spirit so we can do what God has called us to do. And that's good. And then we know when God's doing it because we're filled with His Spirit. It's not kooky. It's not creepy. It's biblical. And there are times when God does this. And it's fantastic that He so chooses upon us to be a part of what He wants to do. See, Peter didn't have to worry about what he was going to say. He didn't have to worry about it because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He's also fulfilling the very words that Christ gave in Matthew 10. When they deliver you, he told his apostles, and he's telling us today, when they arrest you, when they deliver you and hand you over, do not be anxious. Do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it's not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. He says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. When you're in that moment, God says, by the power of his living spirit, I'll show you what you're supposed to do. I'll show you what to say. You just need to trust me for when you're in that moment. So the question for us is, are we with Peter on this? Do we trust God in those moments? We can find excuses to not share God's goodness. I get it. We can say, oh, I'll bring you to church because then my pastor can save you. No, my, I don't save nobody. That's the Holy Spirit's work. Yeah, but if you could just talk to so-and-so, they could explain this better. No, I'm asking you right now, do you believe that the Spirit of the living God can give you the words to speak when you need to? Because he promises to. And Peter's proving that it just happened. We don't got to worry about what we're supposed to say. And, and you want a little trick on being able to speak more about the truth of God? Here you go. Know his word to speak his truth. It's a really good trick. It's called a hack, as these youth call it these days. A hack on how to have the Holy Spirit speak through you clearer and quicker is to know what God's actual words are. What an honor it is for us to be in God's word every day to know what his truth reveals. He says, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? He says, if we're being questioned, if we're being interrogated, Holy Spirit still moving through Peter. He's speaking with some severe boldness and, and intentionality. He's before all the bigwigs. If you remember that picture, he's before all of them. See, but what Peter does, he's such a, he's a fisherman. He shouldn't be this skillful at being an orator. He flipped the whole thing right before our very eyes, right here. It went from a trial about a, some apparent crime to an inquiry about an act of mercy. Just like that, he flipped it on him. He said, this isn't a trial. You want to know about this mercy. You want to know how this guy was healed. We're not on trial here. He's like, you are. He just turned this whole thing around on a dime. He flipped it. Trials are for crimes. But that's not what this was, and Peter knew it. So he, now he's got their attention. Peter just reset the whole stage. They no longer have the power. Even though they're elevated and sitting like this, they no longer got that power. He just took it from them. He says, okay, we performed a good deed. There's no fault in that. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Peter says, listen to me. He just capitalized on a massive opportunity. Because if you remember that picture on the bottom of it, it showed that there was public seating there as well. This place would have been full of people. They are all also interested in what just happened. So now Peter's got a captive audience. And he had a choice. He did not have to go this, this intentional and this big. But he did, because God wanted him to. But see, even though that's what God wants, we still have a choice in how things work. We can reject and deny what he wants. Or we can step right into it, which is what Peter's doing right here. Again, this is all through the power of the Holy Spirit, how Peter changes this all around. And he says, you want to know how we did this? You want to know what power or by what name? He goes, you asked by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That name that they've been trying to hush. 
That name that they killed the man behind. That name that they don't want to hear. He's like, oh, you asked, and that's how we did it. And it's the exact way that he, that he referenced it in chapter 3, when he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He didn't say just Jesus, because Jesus was a common name back then. He didn't say just Jesus Christ, which, which showed that he was the Messiah. But he's like, just so there's no confusion on who this was done in the name of, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So there's no ambiguity. Peter is very bold. He's not trying to be, be in the gray a little bit just to not get in trouble. He's like, no, that's who did this, and that's how we were able to do it. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he says, I don't want you to forget it. You crucified him. Just in case you forgot which Jesus Christ of Nazareth I was talking about, you crucified him. Now, don't forget, he's in their court system. Some of us will be playing it super safe right now, not knowing exactly how this is going to play out. And you can almost sense his passion when he says, whom you crucified. His blood is on your hands. You're like, hey, lighten up, Peter. You might be able to get out of this one. Didn't matter because he's under the power of the Holy Spirit and he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. They knew they killed him. And then they knew that he was resurrected. So these same guys concocted a very bad lie, which if you remember during Good Friday, we poked a lot of holes in how bad this lie really was because it was not provable. And anyway, we won't go there right now. He says, you guys got busted. You killed him and he resurrected from the dead and then you created lies and more lies. The blood, all of this guilt is on you. But see, then he, he's got to finish it. He's like, but it doesn't end right there because God always gets the last word. Because God resurrected him. God raised him from the dead. You tried to silence the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It just backfired on you. They didn't know that Jesus was the anticipated Messiah. We've talked about this ignorance that they were under and their intentions were very, very, very evil. But he's saying, I don't want you to forget, even if it was an ignorance, this is on you. See, their sin is unable to match the power of God. Their sin is unable to match the glory of God. Because that's what gets the last word. He says, by him, by Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this man is standing before you well. It's through his power, not my own, Peter says, he's before you healthy. You can almost picture Peter like pointing at him. Like, can you almost picture that? Like, this guy is standing before you well because of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Peter wants to make sure that he takes no credit for this be pretty easy too if we were honest maybe just a little bit of glory wouldn't hurt right he's like no 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 i had nothing to do with this can we all just agree in our hearts that that's how we should be living our lives we're stewards of everything god has given us from our personalities to our money to our health or lack thereof to to our kids to our families or no, 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 no. we're stewards we simply receive the glory all goes back to him, Peter's like, you know what? All glory. It's in his name. It's in his power, not my own. The cool part, though, is that Jesus let Peter and John be a part of it. He didn't have to. He doesn't need us. But he chooses to partner with us. He chooses us to be his hands and feet, just like today. He chooses us to be a part of what he's doing. I love this. Peter goes on. He says, this Jesus, he's not done yet. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Peter, in most of his messages, draws back to the Old Testament teachings. Why? His primary audience was Jews. His primary audience of who God called him to were those that would have known the Torah, those that would have known the Psalms, those that would have known the laws of God. And so Peter always went back to those to prove to them the Messiah that they killed was the one that was prophesied. He always goes back to that. Just like here, he's quoting Psalm 118. See, this Psalm was called a pilgrimage Psalm. They would have totally known this because if they would have been going up to Jerusalem, they would have been singing Psalm 118 as a group. They would have all been singing this song together. They would have memorized it and they would have known it. Psalm 118, just so you know, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The psalm continues, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. They would have known this. He goes on and says, the famous one that we would know, this is the day that the Lord has made. 
Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How could you rejoice in the cornerstone being taken down? Because they knew what was coming. And he reminds them, you knew what was supposed to happen. You knew what was coming. So whenever I read Prophecy Fulfilled, I always ask myself, why is it in this part right here, why would he have used this exact text? There's a whole Bible that he could have pulled from to talk about this. Well, I think it was for three distinct reasons why Peter referenced Psalm 118. One is to identify their guilt yet again. Because it says right in there that they are the ones who rejected Jesus. That's part of Psalm 118. He's like, I need you to remember. I know I just said that you crucified him, but you also rejected him. So I think the first part is to bring on a little guilt. The second part is to also remind them that Jesus also quoted Psalm 118. In Matthew 21, he's talking to the religious leaders, these same guys. And Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and it'll be given to a nation that will produce fruit. Ouch. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but it will crush the one on whom it falls. And just to be clear, was he talking to the Pharisees? He says in verse 45 of chapter 20, 21 in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Their fear of man issues overtook their ability to lead. They knew that Jesus was talking to them, that they were going to reject him. They knew that they were the ones, and they hated him. Had they feared God instead of man, they would have led differently. And the same exact thing goes for each and every one of us here. When we have fear of man issues, we are not compelled to walk in truth. When we have fear of man issues, we're doing image management and we're trying to, to try to work things out so that it doesn't seem as bad as it is. Do you think Peter has fear of man issues? He's in a court of law telling them that they're guilty and this name that they don't want to hear is what gave this power to this man. No fear of man issues. You might be like, well, that's because he's an apostle. No, no, no. He was human, just like us. <laughs> we, I know we call him Saint Peter, but those in Christ are saints, so we don't need to elevate Peter too high here. He was living this in real time, walking in direct obedience to what God had called him to. And the third reason I believe that he uses this psalm is because he wants to make sure that they know that it was prophetic and it was fulfilled in Christ. Because they're Jews. He's like, you guys are waiting for this. And it, it happened. And now we can rejoice and be glad in it. He says he was rejected by you. He's become the cornerstone. The cornerstone was used in the New Testament to describe the exalted position of Christ. Sure, in the Old Testament, every building that was built had what's called a corner stone, the head of the corner as it's called. And back then, that's how their foundations were built and all of the rocks were interlocked into this corner stone. So everything in a building relied on this one corner. All the weight was on it, all the pressure was on it, and it held it all together. So now in the New Testament, not only is Jesus the chief cornerstone, the one that holds everything together, but he's the anticipated prophesied Messiah who is now exalted, high, and lifted up. That's what cornerstone means in the New Testament. It's fascinating. He says, you rejected him, and now God has exalted him. You rejected him, you killed him, and now God has exalted him, and he's sitting at God's very right side. Talk about an exalted position as cornerstone. See, they can no longer avoid the name of Jesus. Cats out of the bag, as they say. Jesus fulfilled this psalm again. I know, I'm going to keep saying it. When prophecy is fulfilled, your faith should just be incredibly encouraged. Because when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And then when it happens, we're like, oh, you said you were going to do that. That's amazing. Take note of all the prophetic things that are happening in our world today. There's a lot of things happening today. Look around the world and you're going to watch God continuing to answer things that we can't answer, to do things that we just can't do, to, to have things work out in a way that we could never manipulate. So when prophecy is fulfilled, be encouraged. Because God says, I'm a man of my word. And when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So the Sanhedrin is about to learn a couple of powerful points along the way. One of them was this divine opportunity that is going to be unpacked right here. He says, and there is salvation. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name 
under heaven, given among men by which we must be saved. You want to talk about salvation? He's doing it in a court of law. There's salvation found in no one else. I understand this is a fairly famous passage in Acts, but this is not just a bumper sticker. This is a life verse. This is something that is profound. I learned a great definition of salvation this week. And if you want to write something down, maybe this is a, it's a pretty powerful, I'll read it twice, but pretty powerful definition of salvation. Salvation is the deliverance from God's wrath and our ability to enjoy his favor. The deliverance from God's wrath and our ability to enjoy his favor. See, and that salvation is found in no one else, in no other name, in no other power. See, and the, the, the kicker is the Jews, they were showing people what they conceived to be salvation, and it was all through works. That's what the Jews did. They said, you do these things, these additional 613 laws that we put on you, you do these things, and you'll be saved, right? But see, Peter preached that salvation is nothing that is done. It's something that's received. We don't do anything to be saved. Here, here, let me put it simple, kids. Outside of Jesus, there is nothing that anyone can do to be saved. Nothing. Zero, zilch, nada. All we do is receive it. You don't work for it. You don't get your stuff together before you are given salvation. You don't will it. You don't think good thoughts. You simply receive. Everything divine is God down to us, including salvation, especially salvation. All we do is receive it. And there is no other name under heaven, no other name where you can receive salvation I don't know how much more I can be clear. There is nothing you can do to be saved. That's called works-based. We don't believe in that. Now, I will say this. Once you are saved, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not because you have to, but because you get to. So when you are saved, then you, then you get to go work for Jesus? Are you kidding me? Is there a better employer? The King of kings and Lord of lords says, I just want you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because you love me, because you know that I know what's best for you. So work it out. How you live your life, just work it out. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is something about this name, the name of Jesus. It was prophesied to Mary, Matthew 1, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Prophecy fulfilled yet again. Sure. Sure. Jesus healed this man from the effects of sin. He does so much more than that and saves us from our sin. That's the name of Jesus. Jesus removes sin itself so we can stand before the judgment seat of God. So I, I, I need to make sure that you understand, do you know how we stand before God? So let me explain to you. With Jesus... We can stand before God with no sin. The Bible talks about how we are cloaked, clothed, and cloaked in His righteousness. So we're covered by the blood of Jesus. So when we stand before a holy God, which every one of us will have a judgment seat front row, we'll have judgment day coming, but we, with those with Jesus will be able to enter His presence because we are seen as right before God because of Jesus, okay? So if you don't have Jesus, you don't got this cloak on, you can't even come necessarily into the presence of a holy God. He can't have engagement with sin. And without Christ, that's what you are. At the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow that he is Lord. This is all judgment day. This is going to happen. So with Jesus, we can stand before a holy God and enter into his presence for eternity. Without, you don't have the cloak. You don't have it. See, but the cool thing is, is there's salvation in no one else. It's not like the deal's closed. If you can hear my voice, there's still an opportunity to be saved and to have your life transformed in Jesus' name. So that when we do stand before the Father, we got on the right coat. 
the righteousness of Christ. Nobody but Jesus has the ability to remove our sins. Nobody. Peter makes that abundantly clear. The Bible makes that incredibly clear. And religions uh, for thousands of years have just done this wrong. Religion, just by definition, just so you know, is, is man's pursuit of God. That's what religion is. Christianity is God's pursuit of man. So see, religion is us chasing after him, doing things, saying things, being nice, helping old ladies across the street, not cheating on our taxes. Those are all doing things. But Christianity is God coming down to us, making a way where there was no way. And then when you help an old lady cross the street, it's because you love Jesus and you're serving him as serving her. The motives are completely different. It's because you've been loved by him that you're able to love others. There is no other way by which we, there's a really important word here, translated into English as must. Can't miss this. This is a very, very powerful word. It's the only way that we are to be saved. It doesn't say that we may be saved because that, that puts an element of uncertainty in there. You might be saved. No, 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 no. The name of Jesus, you must. It's must. It's must. It, it doesn't mean that, that you, you have, um, oh, I don't know, an opportunity to not be because this is right here for us. The text is what's called definite. It means that it's spiritually, divinely decreed by God, the way that this is written. And so if God's going to save you, that, that's his thing. And that means you're going to be saved. But there's no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. And we know that there's no other way. We can say the text, right? We, we know John 14. We talk about, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Sure, but do you really believe that? Because Peter right here is telling a whole bunch of people who are against what he believes, this very truth. Proclaiming this very truth that he is the only one that offers true salvation, that he is the real deal. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized they had been with Jesus. You can almost hear a hush over the crowd, right? It means over and over again, they're in awe. They're dumbstruck. They, they don't even know what to say because they got no answer for this one. That wasn't in their pharisaical law book on how to respond to street prophets. But see, this is all under the power of the Holy Spirit. And when they saw the boldness, it just means that John, Peter, they had this unshakable confidence. They knew they were doing exactly what God called them to do. That's how we have to be operating our daily lives for those of us that follow Christ, this unshakable confidence. Not just when we're sitting in church, you bet, pastor, nod the old head and give an amen, which is also cool, fine with that. However, when we leave here, we need an unshakable confidence in our faith, in our genuine, deep-rooted beliefs. That means when we're with our family and extended family, when we're at work, when we're at school, when we're at coffee shops, this unshakable confidence that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. See, they perceived doesn't mean they were smart, but they perceived these were uneducated, common men. And they were astonished. These were, these were from Galilee, okay? They wore different clothes. They had a thick Galilean accent. They didn't have to work very hard to perceive that these were just common men. They were fishermen for a living. They probably smelled. And here they are in the presence of all the pomp and circumstance, and so their perception is correct. These are just local yokels, country bumpkins, if you will, and somehow they're using Old Testament prophecy to prove that Jesus Christ is the one that healed this guy. So their mind is, is not working at the moment because this isn't how it's supposed to be. Like, remember Paul? He sat under Gamaliel. One of, the, one, of the greatest, one of the greatest teachers of his time is who Paul learned under. So if Paul was making these arguments, it'd be understandable. But here we have... These, these fishermen able to articulate Psalm 118 and how Christ was the one that fulfilled that, how the blood was on their hands, their mind is blown. They can't figure it out and see they were trying to stop Jesus from doing all these things and now his very own local yokels are doing it in his place. So what's so amazing about this? Well, one is they had the same courage that Jesus had. Jesus too had opportunities to back away and he didn't. So they had his courage, 
but they also brought his message. That's what I love about this. They brought his truth, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. If you forget everything else I say, just think about this for a nanosecond. They knew that they had been spending time with Jesus. See, in the business world, I learned that you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So in the business world, you don't hang out with people that are broke, not closing deals, and not very effective in their business dealings. You hang out with those that are closing deals. You hang out with those that have a very nice portfolio. You hang out with those that are educated and able to do all the blah, 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 blah. You see where I'm going? You average out, and then you represent, you kind of look like those people who you're spending the most time with. What do these lawmakers, what do these religious leaders say? They can tell that they had been with Jesus. You can't fake what's the most important thing to you. Because when Christ has changed your heart, that whole idea of can't stop, won't stop, yeah, that means you're wrecked for life. That means you're going all the way for Jesus. That means that you're all in. But see, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So flip this on to us today. Can I watch your life for a week? And will I be able to say at the end of that week, I've recognized that you've been with Jesus. Each of us, each of us just permeate what's most important to us. Can't fake it. And I'm not saying that this is about show. I'm not saying that this is about, you know, maybe if I live my right life, I can put on the big screen of me not doing all these naughty, nasty things. No, no, I'm saying if Jesus is most important to you, I can recognize that you've been with Jesus instead of being surprised when you find out that somebody goes to church or they're in the leadership team of that church. And then you find that out and you're like, wow, they'll let anybody in the club. But not this. They had recognized, they can see that they had been spending time with Jesus. So are you? Do you spend enough time with Jesus to average out that that's what people will recognize? Because we either look like Jesus or the world. There's not a third option. It's your call. Because I know that if you spend time with Jesus, you're going to emulate his heart Amen. and how you live your lives. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say. In short, they shut him up because the guy that was just healed was standing there and they couldn't say anything about it. I think it's safe to say this trial wasn't going exactly as they had planned. So now they've got an issue to deal with. Uh, they got to figure out because they can't deny what was going on. So what they did is they commanded them to leave the council. They conferred with one another saying, so now they're gone, right? So they say, what, what are we going to do with these men for a notable sign has been performed through them? It's evident to all the inhabitants. There's too many witnesses. We cannot deny it. When it says they conferred, they're bantering ideas because they just don't know what to do. They've never had to go through this before, and now they've got a real problem. The main one is their fear of man issues. They can't stop this. They can't shut this up. Too many people saw the guy laying there for 40 years, now dancing a jig out in the temple yard. So they got a problem, and now these very apostles are saying that it was Jesus who did it. They're like, no, we tried to stop that. So they needed a plan, and they didn't have one, so they asked each other, you guys are the smartest men in all Jerusalem. What should we do with these men? Because if they release them, they're going to get in trouble, because why did they arrest them in the first place? Fear of man yet again. If they punish them for doing a miracle, well, that's injustice. That'll make them look bad. Fear of man issues yet again. They say it's a notable sign has been performed. We can't deny it. This is a quandary to be sure. And the problem is their disciples are being just like their Savior. They're acting just like Jesus. They're not only doing miracles, but they're not backing down. And they're being really honest about it. So here's what I know. Being good should get you in trouble. Not doing bad. You get arrested for sinning, that's on you. I don't even know if I'm going to come visit you. You get arrested for doing good. You get arrested for proclaiming the truths of Christ, for living out your faith. That's the model that's being set here. We don't get in trouble for sinning. And it's only going to get harder and worse. 
Jesus prophesied it. Remember, when he prophesies something, it's going to happen. So Jesus says in Matthew 10, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. It's a promise. It's a prophecy. So we need to be ready for whatever's coming. We have to be living our lives as such that whatever comes, we're in. And we're going to endure to the end to be saved. It means non-Christians are going to hate you for doing what Christ wants you to do. That's what this means. For us here, it, it's going to look different than the rest of the world's persecution. We live in a first world country. I get it. But I have a friend of mine who, who got into a debate with some people over abortion. And he was basically persecuted and ostracized from this very group for his belief that, that we shouldn't kill babies and that we need to protect babies. And it was in a mixed group. And you would think that that would be a pretty safe conversation. It's not anymore. As we stand for what God views right as sexuality or not smoking pot or doing all these things, you're going to be made fun of by people. They don't agree with us. They don't agree with Jesus. Okay. That's all I have to tell you. Okay. Because it's coming and it's only going to increase. So Christ followers, we need to be ready for when people hate you because you love Jesus. So the Sanhedrin realizes they don't got a case. They don't got a case. In order that may spread no further, they're, they're still talking amongst themselves, right? Let us warn them. Here's their scheme. This is their brilliant plan. Let us warn them to not speak anymore. So they debate. They make this choice. Let's set them free. Let's put some conditions on this so that, that they're clear that we're really, we're really serious about this, them not talking about Jesus anymore. Their goal is to have them speak no more and when you see the word further, this idea of no more, they realize that the name of Jesus is spreading all over. And they're still trying to figure out how to stop it. So like, okay, if we can get them to just stop saying his name, it won't spread any further. So what they're about to imp uh, impose upon the apostles, we still have today. It's called peer pressure. See, Christians, we don't give in to peer pressure. That's not what we do. And they didn't, they, you'll see here in a second, they, they didn't either. See, and, and peer pressure does work sometimes, but not for Christ followers. We don't give in to what the rest of the people are doing just because they say this or they say this. We just follow what Jesus says. And kids, I'll put it simple. We don't change our behavior based on people's opinions. See, they're trying to silence God's people by not even using the name of Jesus. But they can't change what they're going to do based on their opinions. You understand how foolish that sounds, how hard it is, but how foolish it really sounds to be able to silence the name of Jesus. This should inspire us to go and spread the name of Jesus. I know we live in a first world country where it's not illegal to have these. Okay? But that doesn't mean that everybody out there doesn't need to know what truth is. And there is salvation found in no one else. There's no better, more powerful name. We all spread the message, whatever that is. We all spread a message. I'm just challenging you to be spreading the right one. And we need to be ready to do whatever it is that God is calling us to. So you got to picture this scene. Peter and John were called out. Now they're called back in. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They just walked through a miracle. They just got interrogated, flipped it onto them to show them the act of mercy. So they called them and charged them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They finally said his name. <laughs> so things are looking up. They finally said Jesus' name. So their charge is, is nope, we, we, you don't get to talk about it anymore. You have to understand something. I know that we've already read the end of this story. But like I mentioned in the intro, they were living this real time. They had a decision to make. So this is what could be considered worst case scenario, right? Don't say another word about Jesus. So they have a choice to make. These are the same guys that just killed Jesus. So these are the same guys that could kill them. They could have them lynched. They could have them beaten. They could have them tortured. They can do whatever they want. They have that authority by Jewish law. So they have a choice to make. Maybe they could just say, oh, okay, and then go out and still talk about Jesus. So they could lie and, and say, oh, you're right, okay, we won't say anything, and then do sleight of hand, and then they can go talk about Jesus. But when you're lying, does that look like Jesus or the devil? devil. Yeah, the devil. So we don't get a lie and say, oh, okay, we won't do that, but then go do that? That doesn't look like Jesus at all. So they have a choice to make. 
Or they could just, you know, maybe this is a get out of jail free card, literally. Maybe this is our moment. Okay, we got a little bit, we got a slap on the wrist. Maybe we'll just, we'll take their advice and, and we'll figure out another way to do this. We'll be more strategic. See, they, they, have, a, they have a choice to make, to be silent or not. Jesus walking in, the triumphal entry, you know the scene. The religious leaders are like, would you tell your followers to shut up? And he says, if they do, the stones will cry out. The people of God cannot be silent for the work of God. We cannot. So they had a choice to make, though. They still have a choice to make. But see, if we're silent about it, we're not silencing the enemy. So kids, this is a principle. When we declare the truths of Christ, when we declare the truths of Christ, it can silence the enemy. What an awesome put a smile on my face moment that could be. It silences the enemy when we declare the truths of Christ. And it starts with how we live our lives. People need to know that you're a Jesus first guy or gal and that you look like Jesus because you've been spending so much time with him. I say when people try to silence you, get louder. Not weird, not kooky, just biblical. When given an opportunity, if you're ashamed of me before man, Jesus says what? I'm going to be ashamed of you before my Father who is in heaven. When given an opportunity, you don't back down. So Peter and John, they got a choice to make. Before I move on, I, I want to pose this question to you. If someone came to you and said, I charge you, you no longer get to speak in the name of Jesus. No more. They say that to you. Is there going to be anything different in your life? I don't know what that was. <laughs> Is there going to be anything different in your life if they say to you, you can no longer speak about Jesus? Or is it just same, same? See, for them, it would have been incredibly different for their life. My hope is that for you, if somebody says to you, you can no longer talk about Jesus, and you actually had to, just for the sake of conversation and argument, that your life would not look the same. We have a choice to make, just like Peter and John. So Peter, John, they answered them. They, they, they've, they've got a, a moment to, to make this decision, and they're on the fly. They're about to share their faith in a way that is so profound. But Peter and John answered them. Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you, rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Can't stop, won't stop. We too have to make our decisions in real time, just like they did. And they're like, you know what? You go ahead and judge, whether it's right before God or not. But we, we know what we've got to do. We can't actually take and do what you're telling us to do. We're living our lives based on what Christ wanted, not what man wants. It is none of your business what other people's opinions are of you. It's none of your business what they think about you. It's none of your business. Your business is what God thinks about you. And that's where they stood. They said, it's none of my business if you don't like what I'm doing. It's that you go ahead and judge. It's none of my business. But my business is what God thinks about me. He says, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. This brings me all the way back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah says, if I say, I will not mention his name. He says this out loud. If I will not mention his name or speak anymore in his name, Jeremiah says, he says, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in. I cannot. Is that how you are with the word of God, the truths of God, the love of God? Is it burning inside of you to share? That's what this is. This is what Christ followers are called to, to share the goodness and the name of Christ. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We're eyewitnesses to the love of Christ. You want us to not tell people about what he's done? Can't do it. We have to. Jesus set them free. They want other people set free. Jesus set me free. I want everybody set free. I know what it's like to be in bondage and under lies and chasing the wrong stuff. And then I know what it's like to be saved and set free from all that. I never want to go back. And I want that for everybody else. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. John pens almost this exact thing. In 1 John, he says, we've tasted, we've seen, we touched, and we know that the Lord is good. We cannot help 
but tell people about what he's done. Brings it all together. When they had further threatened them, they let him go, finding no way to punish them because the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. They don't got a case because there wasn't one. So they had to let him go. And it says they further threatened them. And again, we only get part of the argument here. It, it means they continued to, to, to basically debate with them and to try to stop them. It's not like they just rolled over and said, you know, no big deal. No, they continued to try to fight them. But see, the apostles won. Why? Because they desired to obey God and not fear man. That's for us and every one of us here today. Sure, take the easy way out and deny the opportunity that God has placed before you. You have to give an account for that. I don't want that for you. See, the, the wild thing is the Sanhedrin, all these religious leaders, they knew the truth. <laughs> they knew that he resurrected. They knew that this guy was just healed through his name. They know this. But knowing and doing are two separate things. The 16 inches between your head and your heart can be a mile long. Because knowing is one thing. Great. Good for you. I'm glad you know more things. You've been listening to more podcasts. That's fantastic. Why don't you start living it out? Because they knew the truth. And what did they do? They continued to reject it. It's not enough to know. It's not enough. God is calling his people to action. They desired to obey God. So they throw some threats, right? They try to be heavy-handed. But they had a problem. All the people were praising God for what had happened. So their whole plan just continues to backfire even worse. Scholars say by about this point, there would have been well over 5,000 men saved, which in reality is probably over 20,000 new Christians in just the last little bit. This name of Jesus was not about to stop being spread. They were all praising God for what he had done. And you know what the cool thing is? It's because Peter and John obeyed. Now, I love Esther, the book of Esther, right? If it's not now, he'll bring somebody else to do his work. I get it. We have a choice whether or not that we partner with the king of kings, and they did. And because of that, all the people are now praising God. How many of you want that for your own life? Because of how you lived and the choices that you make, people begin to praise God because of the decisions that you have made. We should all want this. People praising God by how we live our lives. For the sign on whom this, uh, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. They couldn't deny it. And thankfully, God supernaturally worked through his sovereign will, his Holy Spirit, and his two vessels to do what he wanted to do. The evidence is irrefutable, so they send them on their way. And see, they, they tried to silence them. But actually, when you try to silence God's people, we should just get louder. Just like the message that we're bringing. We should get a lot louder. It's this whole idea of can't stop, won't stop. Galatians 6, 9, And do not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. Don't quit. Romans 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. That's a Christian thing to do, just so you know. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces steadfastness, and steadfastness produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out. God's love has been generously poured out through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us, but we don't quit. We don't stop. James 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kind. Why? Knowing something very profound is happening. God is producing in you steadfastness. That's what he's calling his kids to. Don't quit. We are called by God to finish strong. And I hope that we all capitalize on the love that's being offered to us today. Every one of us, those that follow Christ and those that don't. I hope we capitalize on this gift of salvation found in no one else today. But see, we got to place our trust right here. We're not just going through this sermon series because I had nothing else to preach on. 
God wants us to know that it's okay to trust him in our unexpected journey when things are not, especially when things are not going how we want. He says, I'm right here with you. I just need you to rely on me and stay with me. We have to live this out 24-7. Regardless of what you're going through, we do not change our behaviors based on what others think or even what they're really telling us to do if it goes against what God wants. I need you to have that tenacity deep down that whatever comes your way this week, you're linked arms with Jesus and you're in this, you're in this to the end. And if you have a chance to be a coward, I pray that you would be courageous. I really do. Instead of backing down from the opportunity that God has given to you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Greek. His salvation is being offered today. So can't stop, won't stop. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus Christ, I give you thanks that you have given us this call to not stop. Yeah, sure, I understand that, that we've got to have tact in, in certain ways and we have to be able to have these conversations in such a way that can express your love and your heart. But God, I, I pray that you would give us just those this week, that we would have these divine opportunities as your sent ones, as your missionaries, God, into our respective mission fields, that you would give us these divine opportunities to we, where we could proclaim what we have seen and heard. That we could proclaim that there was no way, God, and you made a way through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that our hearts would be broken for things in our life that don't reflect you. And that we would be able to stand firm, God, in what it is that you've called us to do. And I thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to be able to do all of this. And we just bless you, Jesus. And we give you thanks. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.